myself as a kind of loud person, so I'm a little bit worried about the microphone, but hopefully we'll be fine. Um, so uh, we're gonna actually pass around the registration sheets uh, just to avoid having people backing up. Um, but do make sure that you all have a packet and a survey. Um, you're gonna need both of those. And the surveys, if you wouldn't just leave them back on this table or on, there should be a desk back there as you leave. They're all anonymous, so feel free to you know, tell us what didn't work as well as anything that did work. Um, and you know, be critical because we're always trying to improve these and make them better and better for the next people. So um, they are really important to us. If you'll take a few minutes at the end of the workshop and fill them out, and like I said, leave them at this table or the desk on your way out or even right at your seat, whatever is most convenient. All right, so I'm gonna wait a couple minutes for everybody to get seated, um, just so that you guys know who I am. My name's Mackenzie, I'm a PhD student here in the English department. Uh, this is my second year working with the GWC, and this is Chen Chen. Um, I'll introduce her for her because she's busy. <laughs> Chen Chen is also a PhD student in the English department. Uh, she's slightly cooler than me, but only slightly. Uh, so today we're going to be talking about strategies for writing literature reviews. And there's not going to be a whole lot of overlap from the conversations on introductions the other day, or yesterday. Um, so that should be good for everybody. Um, Uh-oh, are we out of packets? Oh, you passed them. Okay, okay, good, all right. So packets are going around, awesome. Um, so, but obviously the, the literature review is either a separate document or a very important part of your introduction. So just keep in mind as I'm talking about literature reviews today that the things that I'm saying will apply to both types of literature reviews. Um, granted, they're not exactly the same, but the general principles are very, very similar. So just keep that in mind. When I say literature review, it can be the longer one or the shorter one as part of your paper. Okay, awesome. We got a good crowd today. So, um, first thing I like to start with when I talk about literature reviews is just to admit that, in my opinion, they're the most awful thing that you'll have to do in academia. Um, I really, really hate writing literature reviews. Uh, I find them super challenging, and then you do all this reading for like a couple paragraphs of information, and it feels really not rewarding, at least to me. Um, so I kind of just wanted to start out with, if anybody would like to share, um, if you love literature reviews, you can share that with me too. But um, if anybody, just raise your hand, want to say like, um, you know, this is why I hate literature reviews, or this is what I find challenging about them, or this is what I'm hoping this workshop will address today, uh, just raise your hand and I'll come give you this really snazzy microphone. No brave people. Come on, you get to talk into a microphone. It's exciting. Okay, am I the only, I'm the only person here who hates literature reviews. Okay, all right, that's fair, that's fair. I'll just feel like a bad grad student all by myself. All right, so we'll go ahead and get into our conversation then. So today, um, I'd just like to start off by telling you a little bit about the GWC if you're not already familiar. We, in addition to doing these workshops, we offer one-on-one -on -one consultations. Um, there are 50 minutes long, and they are not discipline specific, so you can come see us if you're in hard sciences, social sciences, education, whatever you happen to study. Um, <clears throat> and we deal with writing at you know, any stage of the process, whether you want help brainstorming, um, you're, you know, this is your fifth draft, and you just have a question about this one paragraph that you're having a really hard time with, um, you have a presentation that you're giving and you want to just like go through it with us and practice one time. So really anything having to do with communication, so not just writing, but anything having to do with communication, we're happy to work with you on. Um, our hours are posted every Friday at 4 o'clock in the afternoon on our website, which is just gwc.psu.edu, so gwc .psu.edu. I feel like one of those people reading the phone number three times really fast at the end of a commercial. 
All right. And yeah, we don't actually have brochures today, so you cannot see them for scheduling information. Um, but all of our information is on our website. Okay. So this workshop has some very specific goals. Um, obviously, we want to understand the purposes and characteristics of the effective literature review writing strategies. Um, you know, what does an effective literature review look like? How do we enter a scholarly or academic conversation effectively? Um, then we're going to talk about some strategies for inventing and organizing and revising your literature reviews. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about critically assessing your sources because as we know, you could read and read and read and probably never be done reading. So it's important to know when to stop and how to be able to figure out, you know, this is important or this is not an important source. So hopefully we'll get to cover all of that today. All right. Good stuff. So purpose of a literature review is obviously to look at the important existing information on your very specific focus topic, right? Um, so the key word there is, you know, existing research that is significant and related to your topic. Um, so you want to be able to tell, you know, like, what matters, what doesn't matter. Um, it's not an exhaustive, like, this is what I thought when I was first writing my, my first literature, literature review, which is maybe why I hate them. I thought that, like, you had to write about every single thing that was even slightly related to your topic. Um, and that will just make your life miserable, and it won't make for a good literature review. So the significant work that is relevant to what you're, you're talking about. You also want to provide some background on your topic ever so briefly. Um, you know, if you're talking about a debate that's been going on for forever, you maybe want to say, like, the problem that that debate is addressing or the social issue that the debate is related to. If you're talking about a particular model or method of analysis, you may want to say, like, why that model originated and when. Um, so provide the relevant background on your topic in general. And then establish why your topic is important, right? Um, so those two things can, can go together. The background could be, you know, this whole field emerged because there was an issue that existed in society, right? So they don't have to be separate things, but you want to make sure that you're addressing both of those things, the importance and the background in your literature review. Also, literature reviews exist to just kind of say, you know, hey, I'm smart. I've read the material in this field, and, and I know things. Um, so you can, therefore, trust me um, and trust that my research is good research. And then, obviously, carving out a space for your research. I'm sure that's something that you guys have heard a million times. Find a gap. Um, or a place for you to improve other people's work um, and then show how your research is going to do that. Okay. So you want to outline important research trends in the conversation. Um, and for me, the best way to kind of do that has always been to start with what is recent. Um, so this is one of my kind of strategies for narrowing down the work that I do is I, you know, start with what is most recent um, instead of starting with, oh, this is a seminal text from 1980. Um, and then I have to look at everything this person has referenced. And then I have to look at everything else in the 1980s. Like, that is, that is going to be a miserable experience for you. So start with what's most recent. Um, and then when you go back more than 10 years, it should only be things that people are referencing consistently. Um, so that, that for me has been the best strategy. I just start with the things in 2014 um, and then see what they're referencing and typically try not to read anything um, or too many things before, you know, 2007. Um, and I think in the sciences this is especially true. And in literature it's actually less true because there's a lot of really important work or seminal work that's been done way back when, um, especially when you study Shakespeare, which is what I study. Um, so, but anyway, start with what's most recent, and that will help you kind of identify what is significant in the field, um, and then you can kind of zero in from there. Assess the strengths and weaknesses of existing research. Obviously, that's something that a good literature review is going to do. So, um, one mistake that people typically make is that they just try to summarize everything, but actually, the literature review is much less about summary than it is about critique um, and analysis, right? So make sure that, you know, you're not just saying, here's all the research. 
um, but you're saying like, here is the valuable research. Here is what's value about, valuable about it, right? Um, and here is maybe the research that's not as strong. Here's how it could be better. Obviously, you're going to identify potential gaps in knowledge. Um, and this doesn't just refer to you filling that initial research gap, um, but also, you know, just in the course of analyzing a particular method or a particular approach, you might say, you know, like, this researcher used a method that is actually no longer used today because, um, you know, these reasons, and we've developed our, we've developed our knowledge such that we now use other methods, right? So, kind of identifying gaps is something that, that you do for a lot of your sources and not just that one major gap. Um, and then obviously establishing a need for current and future research projects is something that your literature review is going to need to do. Um, so if you're writing the literature review as like part of your own introduction, that's kind of where you say, hey, um, look, there's this failing or there's something that could be better about the current research that's out there. Let me show you how my research is going to address that failing. Um, in a longer literature review that exists solely to review the literature, that's kind of where when you talk about the need for current or future projects, you kind of just say, like, this is the direction that the field needs to go in, not necessarily this is the gap that my research fills. Okay. So before we talk through major steps of writing a literature review, does anybody have any burning questions for me or anything that I said that was unclear or misleading in any way? Let me get the microphone. Okay, so we're, we're filming this and this microphone thing is very new to me. Um, so I might forget it a couple of times. Okay. Uh, my question is about deep literature review. Is uh, you mentioned that we can skip some of the works and just mention the main ones, but uh, then wouldn't we bias the credits to more recent authors rather than the original work that was like the most original? Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, so in a deep literature review, I think you are going to be talking about more of the literature than you would in like a literature review that is part of your introduction. But I still think it's almost impossible for any literature review to be completely exhaustive. Um, so what I would recommend is, you know, you start by identifying the more recent work that is really relevant. Um, and you do that by reading in the journals that are the leading journals in your field um, or things that your advisor recommends. Um, things that are cited in other important articles, you know, stuff like that. So you want to identify that first and then identify what they are citing. Um, because typically, even if there is research in a given field, if it's not being cited and hasn't been cited in a long time, it's not really something that people need to know about. Um, so I think, I hope that answers your question. I would say in a deep re literature review, you do want to be more exhaustive, but you almost never want to, I mean, you're never going to be able to be completely exhaustive. Um, so you do have to pick and choose. And the strategy that works for me is starting very small, picking five or six research articles that I know are super relevant to what I'm talking about, um, and then looking at what they reference. And then if I decide after I write my draft, right, oh, this isn't enough, um, it's lacking some information, I can always go back and add, right? And that's going to be much easier than trying to take research upon research upon research and put it together for the first time. Yes. Hello, everyone. Mine is more just a, a comment. So I think that literature, literature reviews are important because something that was said a lot of years ago and no one has been looking at it. Uh, so, so far, we can give it a brand new look of it and just update some gaps in information, just uh, uh, putting it t together and updating it uh, for, for this time. So I think that's another reason why we, we should write more literature reviews. And some other people are more biased, like if, if they don't see it uh, in, the, in the last years, they, they won't pay attention to it because they will say, that's, uh, that, that was said a lot of years ago, and uh, that's not important anymore. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, that's an excellent point. So I would say, like, 
the thing I just said was a good general rule for starting a literature review, definitely, um, and for maybe like first drafts. But yeah, if you happen to run across something, and then use your own discretion there, but if you run across something that you're like, this is really important and nobody talks about this, and I think I want to bring it back up, I think that's an excellent thing to do, and I think that is a good service that literature reviews can do for, for people in the field, definitely. So thank you for bringing that up, it's good. Any other questions or comments before we move on? Yes, ma'am. All right, hi everybody. Um, I, I guess my question is um, looking at background information for like specifically scientific papers, um, when you're going about writing your literature review, obviously you're just reviewing um, information in your field, but if, you're, if you need to provide background information for that material, is that like more or less in like an introductory like section that this is what you're going to be talking about or do you need to go like less in depth with the background information? Okay. That's another really great question. So my answer is going to be very unsatisfactory. I would say it depends. Um, so I think definitely um, in a longer literature review, I personally as a reader would prefer to get some background first. Um, I want to know, you know, like, if you're talking about a specific method, let's say, what this method is um, and why it's important, why it's relevant, um, why people use it to begin with before you delve into the literature. Um, and in a shorter literature review as part of a longer argument, I think that that background information might more logically get woven in as you see fit later in your, in your larger argument. Um, so, you know, there might be a point at which you say, you know, um, here's my bare bones literature review, here's what's going on, here's what's missing. Um, and then later in your research you might say like, this person uses the method incorrectly because, right? And then let me tell you why the method has traditionally been used a certain way and why it should continue to be used that way. So I think that it's gonna be kind of your own discretion and thinking about what is useful to the reader, like when should they get this information, but I do think in a longer literature review, it's almost always true that that background information is useful first. Does that answer your question? Sort of. <laughs> okay, okay. All right, any other questions or comments? Okay, awesome. So, we'll move along. Um, and one thing that I want to say, I'm not sure if I'm going to end up repeating it, but if I do, that's okay. Um, when you write your literature review, you want to keep in mind that you're not writing it for yourself. And I think this is something that Michelle and Shannon actually covered yesterday in the introduction. But when you're writing, you're not writing for you. You're writing for your reader. Um, so when you're doing a literature review, it's not just, here, let me tell you everything that I know and everything that I've found and everything that I think is cool. Um, but it's, you know, here's a specific thesis or a specific topic that you need to understand. Let me tell you the information that is relevant to that topic and only the information that is relevant to that topic. Because if you're thinking about the reader, you don't want to be giving them a lot of extra stuff that they then have to wade through and you don't want them to be sitting here going, why am I getting this information? Um, I don't think this is relevant to the, the topic or I don't understand what's going on here. Um, so sometimes it's better to to pare down for your reader. Um, and then that's similar to what we were talking about with the background, right? You give that background in the place that is gonna be most useful to your reader. Okay. Good, awesome. So, these are the major steps for writing a literature review. Um, keep in mind that it's not necessarily like a one-way linear, you know, sequence of events. You might have to circle back to planning or analyzing or drafting and drafting and drafting, if you're like me, um, I have to write about five drafts before anything even makes sense. Um, so this is not a sequential like, oh, I've planned, I'm done, and oh, I've, you know, analyzed, I'm done. You're going to have to be cycling through these. But these are the, the major steps as you're writing a literature review. All right, so, and the planning step is something that people tend to want to just kind of zoom through or even skip. Um, but I would say it can actually save you a ton of time if you take the time to sit down and really think about what it is that you're trying to get across, what specifically you want to focus on. Um, otherwise, for instance, let's say you're writing a literature review in the psychology field, right? 
Um, you don't just want to write a literature review on behavioral psychology, right? Um, you don't want to say, okay, well, I'm going to start planning for this lit review. Let me read everything on behavioral psychology because that is going to take you probably years. I mean, I'm not in the psychology field, but I would imagine there's a lot of material there, right? So you want to be able to say narrowly, like, I want to read about how behavioral psychology works for children with autism or for children with, you know, families that grow up on the East Coast or something like that, right? So make sure that you have very clear in your head, like this is my very specific trajectory as you plan, because it will save you a lot of time when it comes to reading and note taking and all of that stuff. Okay, so that's kind of what I just talked about, focus, right? What's the specific thesis problem research question that my literature review is responding to? And as specific as you can get, it's gonna make your job a lot easier later. And like I said, you know, identifying will allow you to sort and categorize information, um, will allow you to more easily say, I need this, I don't need this. Um, okay, and then what type of literature review are you conducting? This is also something that will allow you to very easily, you know, sort information. So if we stick with the behavioral psychology example, right? Um, if you're studying, you know, behavioral psychology as it relates to three-year-olds with autism, um, <clears throat> Are you focusing on theory, right? Are you focusing on perhaps um, some kind of education theory and how that influences behavioral psychology and those approaches? Are you focusing on methodology? Is there a particular you know, procedure that seems to work well with reaching you know, um, children with autism in this age group? Are we doing a quantitative research analysis or is it gonna be more focused on the qualitative work that's been done? Um, and, so, you know, are we talking about policy, right? So I just recently had a client in the GWC that's doing a research assignment related to um, people with disabilities, right? And their focus in their literature review is actually on policy. So they focused on, you know, what people had to say about the ADA um, and stuff like that. So make sure, you know, you're not only focusing on your topic and your thesis, but what genre of literature review you want to write. Obviously, you want to think a lot about scope. Again, being able to narrow that scope is gonna make your job a lot easier. Um, <clears throat> you know, some people will do literature reviews on just the literature that, that's been written in the past 10 years. Um, I see those in the sciences a lot, at least some clients that come in, they say, you know, my literature review is conducted on any literature, or yeah, any uh, criticism done after 2007. I sampled these four journals because they're the leading journals in my field. I use these key terms, right? So that is all related to scope. Um, so you wanna make sure when you're doing this literature review that you have a very clear idea of what your scope is gonna be before you get started reading. Okay. Okay. And then obviously you wanna think about your discipline. This goes kind of back to what I was saying about audience, right? Um, so, I'm in English. If I'm writing a literature review for English on the topic that I study, which is intimacy, um, I'm not going to include socio sociological research on intimacy, right? Because the people who read my literature review aren't going to care about the sociological research. Um, they are English people. That's not what they study, right? Um, so it might be relevant, and it might seem really cool to me, um, but that is not what they're looking for. So be audience-centered and make sure that you're picking sources that are useful to the people in the field that you are writing to. Okay. So obviously another part of the literature review that's really important is deciding what you're going to use, not just what you're gonna read, but what you're gonna use. Um, so your first step is gonna be collecting and reading material. And um, we've talked about some ways to make sure that you are not collecting much more material than you need or reading much more material than you need. And then something else that you'll wanna do, and I promise this feels so painful when you're doing it, at least it feels painful to me, uh, but it will help you so much in the long run. I just took my comprehensive exams. I did not do this for the sources um, that I talked about in my exam, and it was the worst decision. 
Um, so make sure as you're reading, you're not just kind of, I mean, okay, so let me pause. The initial reading you can kind of skim through to say like, I need this, I don't need this, this is valuable research for what I'm talking about, this is kind of tangential, right? So that skimming is great. Um, but once you've kind of decided, I definitely am going to use this source, it's really useful to take some notes on these kinds of things, right? So obviously, who's the author? But um, what is the author's thesis, right? So that's something that you want to kind of jot down. And I like to have this in a running Word document, or I have, I use notes, so I have my little note tabs. So I like to have all this information somewhere where I can easily cut and paste and move around um, and highlight things. Um, but whatever method works for you, whatever method of recording. Um, so the thesis, their theoretical perspective, right? So things that'll be useful for you to know later when you do your literature review, you know, are they approaching this from a particular theoretical perspective? Are they using a particular methodology? Um, you know, is this a quantitative study? Is it a qualitative study? Those are things that are going to be useful to have just for you to organize your information into groups later, um, which is something Chen Chen's going to be talking to you about, actually. Okay, obviously we want to know who the intended audience is. Um, this might sound like something that is not super relevant to you, but it actually helps for you to be able to jot down and say, like, well, who are they particularly speaking to? Because that might be relevant when you're organizing your information late, later. You might be able to say, you know, well, everybody who does research in this field speaks to this group of people, but they actually don't address the needs of Y group of people. Um, and I think that they should, or, you know, I think that that would be a good idea for moving the field forward. And then what is their conclusion? Um, what are the major contentions they make? What are the, the questions they ask? So try to keep all this information to a paragraph because if you let it get really long, then it's not going to be as useful to you for quickly sorting information. If you write five pages on every article you read, then it's just going to feel like you're reading the articles all over again. Um, but I would say try to condense, you know, to an abstract length. Um, paragraph where you kind of have the most important information for all of the sources that you definitely know that you want to use. Okay. Oh, here are some other things to consider. Um, how does the author, you know, support their point, right? So what kind of evidence do they use? Do, they, do you think it's good evidence? Do you think it's weak evidence? Um, again, is it qualitative, quantitative, that kind of thing. How does this study relate to the other studies, right? So if you can be jotting down as you're taking notes, um, you know, oh, I think this is like a different article that I read, you know, a couple of days ago. Let me go ahead and make a mental note that like these things might belong in the same category and I might want to touch on them in the same paragraph when I write my literature review. So any relations to other studies, those are very important things to kind of make note of. What would this study add to your project or what could your study add to their project, right? Um, so how is it related, essentially, to what I want to do, um, to what I'm interested in? And then any of the strengths and weaknesses, just more generally, if you notice something like, oh, I don't really like this about this study, um, it's good for you to just go ahead and note that and write it down. Okay. All right. That was a lot of information pretty quickly. Do we have any questions really quickly or comments? Anybody want to vocally disagree with anything I've said? Okay, good stuff. I'm glad. Hate it when people disagree with me. Okay, analyzing sources. Okay, so something that I mentioned earlier, but it's worth reiterating. Uh, literature review is never just a list of studies. It's all about your analysis. It's all about framing the information in a way that's going to be useful to your reader. Um, so that means that you're going to be needing to do some synthesizing, comparing, critiquing, summarizing, which is what we'll get to in a second. Um, but obviously, analysis will occur on two levels, at the level of the individual source and at the level of a body of research. You want to probably focus your analysis on the group level, because if you're analyzing every individual source, it's going to feel like you're just summarizing and not analyzing. It's going to feel like you're saying, this source says this. I hate that about it, or I like that about it. This source says this, right? So you really want to try to focus your um, critique on the, the group level, if you can. Okay. So 
These are kind of the major ways that you would perform an analysis through summary, synthesis, critique, and comparison. Um, briefly, sometimes people uh, have a hard time kind of distinguishing what summary is and what synthesis is because they are really, really similar. Um, so for me, at least, summary usually feels like summarizing individual sources and just reiterating what's going on. Um, oh, this, this person says X, or these three people argue blank, right? That's a summary. Whereas a synth synthesis, cannot say that word, a synthesis is bringing together information and framing it uh, appropriately for your reader. So it's not just saying they say this, it's saying, you know, these three studies have a similar weakness, and that weakness is blank. Or, um, you know, the field of behavioral psychology in general frowns upon this method, but I think this method is a good and useful method, right? So th synthesis is bringing things together in a way that frames them as relevant to what you're saying. And yet you need both. You need summary and you need synthesis. Critique and comparison is pretty straightforward. Um, you're going to need to be drawing, you know, links between all of your studies, right? That's what makes a good literature review. And you're obviously going to be needing to critique bodies of research and individual sources. Okay, so summary and synthesis. Um, these are kind of the questions that you want to ask yourself as you are working on creating these syntheses and summaries. Um, you know, well, what do we know about the immediate area? What are the key arguments, uh, key concepts, key figures? And are, do the studies have any of those in common? Um, what are the existing debates and theories? And what common methodologies are used, right? So those are good points of uh, connection that you can use to make summaries and syntheses. These. And these are just kind of some examples. The first one is obviously an example of summary. Um, Nomaden has just demonstrated blank, right? That's just kind of saying this is what the study says. Um, and this is another example of, it's more summary based because it's just saying early work by these three people was concerned with this. Um, and this is, the last two I think are closer to well, the third one is closer to synthesis where it's saying they compared algorithms for handling blank and then you're going to go on to say, you know, like this was a useful way of comparing algorithms or it was, was not a useful way of doing those things. Okay. And then comparison and critique. Obviously, we're evaluating strengths and weaknesses here. Um, so how are different studies related to each other? what's new or different or controversial about them, um, what views need to be further tested, what evidence is lacking, so what, what do we wish we knew, what are the authors not telling us, right? Um, and then what methods or forms of designing research seem useful or don't seem useful. Okay, so here are some examples of, the first one is critique, um, and Something to note, it's actually at least trying to be a generous critique, right? So the ambitious but flawed study, right? That's exactly what you want someone to say about your work. Um, and then the second one is comparison, right? So these results reflecting the stochastic nature of the flow of goods are similar to those reported in Rosenblatt and Roll, right? All right. So. After you've done all of that work of summarizing things, synthesizing things, um, then you want to make sure that, you know, in your analysis you're doing these things. So you could demonstrate the topic's chronological development if there is a clear chronology, right? Uh, you could show different approaches to the same problem. You could show that there's a debate that's going on. You could center on one seminal work and say how things have, you know, kind of spread outward from that work, or you could demonstrate a paradigm shift. So we used to think about the issue this way, but now we think about it this way, right? So there are lots of different ways you can go about organizing your information and thinking through it, and Chen Chen is actually going to walk you through some of those right now. We, nope, we are. 
the most forgetful person ever. All right, so it should be about page seven in your packet. And just go ahead and talk amongst yourselves, read the sample literature review, and then we'll get back together and we'll see what you guys came up with. We're running out of them. We ran out? Mm -hmm. Okay.
Okay, so if everybody could kind of wrap up their conversations within the next minute or so, and then I'll see what you guys have to say about this wonderful literature review. Okay, sorry if I am cutting off any generative conversations, but we are on a tight schedule. Okay, so um, does anybody want to share their thoughts on, you know, what this literature review could have done better, if we're being generous? Uh, yes. So first of all, to mention, probably I would have been fired if I would write this literature <laughs> review. It's fair. Um, <laughs> And what we've noticed is that the comparison is quite irrelevant to, to what we've seen because uh, the first paper is focusing more on the disease as the like medical focus on three diseases. And the second one is more like psychological and connecting it to alcohol and uh, human addiction. So it's quite irrelevant in, the, in this context to debate for. And also, it seems that one paper is from 1977, and the other one is from 2012. And I highly doubt that in this period of, uh, I don't know, uh, 40 years, nobody told anything. <laughs> um, and uh, it's really bad literature review. OK. <laughs> well, see, I was trying to be generous. Um, but I'll, yeah, OK, so I'll give you one more second. But yeah, something that I really like the point that you made. Um, if you're going to make a comparison, they should be fair comparisons, right? Um, you don't want to kind of set up straw men and say, like, oh, look, this person believes this. And then 40 years later, someone believes something wildly different. Well, of course they do. The field has moved, right? Um, so if you're making comparisons, make sure you are making comparisons between research that is similar uh, in a significant way, right? Um, and then, yeah, I think you were just saying, like, be thorough, use the appropriate evidence. All those are really great points. Thank you. So I think that also the statements that are written in here, they, they it will lead to a dead end because they, they do not say anything. One says something and the other one says something totally different. So uh, you you cannot draw the conclusion that's, that's written in, in the first sentence from, from that statements alone so I, I would say that he needed more statements that would drive these uh, these type of uh, of review to, towards something uh, a conclusion mm -hmm. yeah that's great so that's something else that you really want to keep in mind right um, he was noticing that the evidence didn't really connect with the conclusion right so you want to make explicit how that evidence connects to what you are claiming, right? So that you don't have that issue where somebody's going like, I don't understand, I think you're making things up. I don't see how these things go together at all, right? So be very explicit how those connections work. Excellent point. Okay, maybe one more person. All right, let me, I wait till it turns to me, okay. Okay, so this is also a comment about the dates. The fact that his first sentence says that new research claims it is difficult to draw the connection, whereas the most recent research according to this actually shows a conclusive connection, so he's going exactly against what his first opening statement was <laughs> by giving information. It's just completely irrelevant. Absolutely. All right. That's, yes, another good point. So don't lie to your readers. It's a good rule. Don't make things up because they will catch you, right? Um, so yeah, make sure that, you know, when you're thinking through your evidence, you're actually analyzing it thoroughly and saying, okay, these claims I'm making, do I just want the evidence to support those claims? Or does the evidence actually support those claims, right? Um, it, sometimes it's hard to tell the difference. So uh, that's why you come to the GWC or get someone else to read your literature review, right? Okay, so as much as I love to talk, I'm gonna hand things over to Chen Chen for a little while, and she's gonna talk to you guys about some really useful organizational strategies for your lit reviews. All right, uh, I'm going to take over from Mackenzie. 
and talk about uh, organization. Right? So once you um, summarized, um, compared, synthesized, and critiqued your sources, and then you gradually started to uh, contemplate upon the overall picture you want to present through a literature review essay. Uh, granted, this might be the most difficult part, but personally, I really enjoy writing literature review, especially thinking about, <laughs> especially thinking about how I'm going to come through the previous scholarship, how I'm going to not only demonstrate my familiarity with the scholarship, but at the same time, right, sort of carve a space for myself, make my intervention into, pre, uh, into the scholarship, and then sort of establish my own cachet. Um, but anyway, so, um, we, that, that's why organization, uh, common organizational patterns come to help, right? So um, we have five common approaches to organizing the body of your paper, of your literature review essay, right? So these five common approaches are topical, distant to close, debate, chronological, seminar study. Uh, so we're gonna elaborate on um, each one of them with examples um, in the later slides. Uh, so topical organization is the most common approach. Um, so it usually breaks the field into a number of subfields, subject area, or approaches. Uh, it discusses each subsection individually, sometimes with critiques of each. Uh, and, most, and it is most useful for organizing a large body of literature um, that does not have one or two studies uh, that stand out as the most important, uh, or a clear chronological development. So for example, so for, for some of you who study immigration in sociology, right? So you can talk about how immigration, it's a broad topic, I know. But you can also divide the field, right? So uh, the sociological way of studying immigration into several um, subfields, right? So some probably, some people who um, study immigration uh, in a, in a, from, from, a political scientist, uh, from a political scientist perspective, they approach it um, differently from, let's say, uh, people who are interested in the history of immigration. Right? So you can break the field into several aspects, into several themes, or even approaches. Um, so some of the typical language that uh, you can employ in your own literature review essay um, can be three important areas of this field have received attention. Um, and they list, you know, the themes that, I guess, the ways in which they have talked about it, the, the ways in which they have dealt with uh, the, the, the topic you're analyzing. A has been approached from two's perspective, and, and B has, a, has been, has been uh, approached from a, another different perspective. C has also been an important area of study in this field. Right? So if you look at an example, as a matter of fact, uh, in your packet, I think, I believe it's, um, Page seven. Okay. Right, so if you go to page eight, as a matter of fact, uh, you should be able to find an example um, under the hotline, uh, under the heading topical, right? So there's an example. Uh, I'm going to invite, I'm going to have one of you to explain the rest of us why you think this one falls into the category of topical approach, topical organization. Anybody? I know this is a fairly straightforward, but I've, um, I really appreciate if someone can sort of chime in and see why you think this one falls into the category. Or if you disagree, uh, you might suggest other alternatives. And if there were volunteers, oh good, I was going to pick up Yeah, thank you. It seems like each of the items after a number is a separate research question or research project. Mm -hmm. Exactly, right. So, so in this example, three important aspects of the field have received extended critical attention. Obviously, the author is interested in uh, the revising of literature review, right? So um, previous scholarship, it seems, has been uh, divided into three different, uh, different parts, different aspects. Some of them are interested in the length of students spent on writing literature review. Some of the scholars are interested in the amount of revision typically required by thesis advisors. And a third area of research is commonly focused on the extent to which highlighters help or hinder the review process. Right? So this is, an, uh, uh, I guess, a typical example of topical organization. Um, so distant to close organization um, usually study, uh, usually 
group studies by their relevance to current research. Uh, it starts by describing studies with general similarity to current research and ends with studies most relevant to the specific topic. The reason that you start with studies um, more, uh, that has more general similarities because you want to foreground your research, right? So you want to, you want to, you want to, you want to establish the context under which uh, formal research has been done. Uh, and later, you want to end with study most relevant and most pertinent to your specific um, topic. The reason is because uh, you want to gradually move your audience to your particular research question, right? So ultimately, uh, when you venture into writing your literature review, your idea about what you are going to do, what your invention is going to be, is still very murky. But gradually, after the literature review essay, you, your intervention is going to be much, much more explicit. Uh, say, for example, um, I think one of my clients majored in plant, majored in plant biology. So one of the approach, actually he adopts the distant to a close uh, organization. So he was studying mechanical signaling. signaling. Uh, and then he starts with very general research on mechanical signaling and gradually moved to a particular plant and ultimately focused on the one particular component. Uh, I guess one particular aspect of that plant, right? So, so gradually it moves uh, to uh, the, his topic. Um, so it's most useful for studies of methods and uh, models. Uh, so you, you are likely to use languages here, methods uh, or model M. Uh, you don't really want to, you don't really want to uh, include uh, what's, 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 pu what's put in the parenthesis in your literature review essays. These are only for your mental notes, right? So you want to start with research that's slightly similar to your current research and then move gradually to more similar, uh, to studies that's more similar to your research. And ultimately, you want to provide uh, studies that's most pertinent, most relevant to your own research. So if we look at it, if you look at an example, as a matter of fact, uh, it should be very uh, revealing. Um, so if we look at this example, okay, so starting from the first sentence, sociological studies of human bounds have studied marriage, friendship, and the family, but few have theorized that which links these different types of relations, intimacy. Okay? So it starts with something broad. Sociological studies have done this but they have missed something, which is intimacy, right? So notice how the language gradually sort of foregrounds your topic. And ultimately, you move to what your research is going to be about. My study, if you look at the very last sentence, my study will build upon a previous scholar's work by, you know, uh, you fill in the, the blank yourself. All right, so moving to debate organization. Uh, it can have uh, it's, a, it's, a very, it's a variation of the approach uh, organization, right? So it can have a chronological uh, element, but sometimes people don't necessarily have a chronological element. Um, it emphasizes various strands of research in which proponents of various models openly criticizes one another, right? Um, so um, when, you, when you attend this workshop, you've pre uh, we've emphasized the importance of establishing a conversation, right? So you want to establish a conversation. You also ultimately want to join a conversation. That's the, that's the point of writing uh, a literature review essay. Right? So obviously, in your literature review essay, you also want to put, put the scholars, put the, pre, put the prior uh, scholarship into conversation with one another. Right? So if you choose to use, it, use debate, um, if you choose to adopt this particular uh, organizational pattern, you want to emphasize the various trends, the, rare, the various strands of research uh, in which proponents uh, of different approaches openly criticize one another, right? In other words, uh, you want to, first of all, put them into conversation, right? Second of all, you want to see um, how they disagree or agree with one another. Uh, and oftentimes, they're very critical uh, with each other's research. Uh, it's most useful when clear opposing positions are present in the literature. Uh, so if they are openly disagreeing uh, and they are critical, they're very challenging with prior scholarship, uh, and then you want to come across that way, right? And you want to come very harsh um, 
against you know, prior scholarship, chances are you might want to adopt this particular organizational pattern. Um, so here, so these are some typical languages, right? So there has there have been two, three or four or even five distinct approaches to this problem. There should be a two there. The first model posits. Uh, the second model argues uh, that the first model is wrong for three reasons. Uh, instead, the second model claims so and so. And you can also um, have the third model contain something else which contradicts the first, um, the first one as well as the second one. Right? So you no notice how they're taking a really critical stance, right? pointing out the flaws, pointing out uh, the deficiency of prior research. Oh, yeah. Oh, before we do that, so if we can take a look at the example. Um, so this example is on page nine. Uh, it's quite long. So I'm going to. Uh, so let, why don't we why don't we spend uh, a minute or two just um, examining these two paragraphs? Uh, I'm going to ask one one of you to explain the rest of us why you think these paragraphs fall into the category. Uh, or if you if you have a disagreement, uh, tell us what you think. Right. So I'm going to I'm going to give you guys uh, two minutes to look at these two paragraphs. Um, any thoughts? Anybody who wants to talk about why you think this one falls into the category of um, debate organization? How does the how does the author sort of put the put the sources in your conversation, or even not even a conversation, but also a, a, a debate? So it's more, it's even more controversial. Um, so if you look at the first sentence, right, there have been two, three, et cetera, distinct approaches to the field, right? So, and also ultimately in the second paragraph, uh, the first sentence of the second paragraph, um, the second model called the poor prediction model has criticized the Smith proposition on the basis, blah, 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 right? So notice how uh, criticize some of the reporting verbs such as criticize, challenge, contradict uh, have been used. Right. So when you are writing your literature review essay, likewise, uh, if you want to put them uh, into your debate, if you want to put your sources into your conversation, um, and they are also taking a very critical stance, uh, you might want to use some of the reporting verbs. Uh, as a matter of fact, in the packet, if you just flip um, to page six, you should be able to find a lot of Elmo A um, reporting verbs, right? So uh, I think a lot of times people tend to use reporting verbs such as state, claim, uh, argue, you know, but you, you can definitely, you know, use um, other reporting verbs that convey a particular uh, stance or a very um, specific uh, emotion. So if we continue with this, 
the force organizational pattern chronological. Um, I guess the, the, the name itself is very telling, right? So it lists studies in terms of a chronological development. Uh, it is most useful when a field displays a clear development over a period of time. Uh, for example, if you are in physics, I'm sure there, are, uh, there, there has been a lot of there, there has been a lot of paradigm shifts, right, from the Aristotelian to Newtonian to even nowadays quantum <coughs> physics. There has been a lot of uh, paradigm shifts, right? So if you are doing a deep literature review essay, and if there's a need for you to review to map out uh, the status quo of your field of study. So sometimes you might want to adopt chronological, chronological organization. Um, so usually uh, in, your, in your literature review essay, you should be able to notice a lot of uh, uh, words and phrases that signal um, the date and time. So for example, this, uh, this subject was first studied by X, who are you so and so. And in a particular date, in a particular year, uh, someone else modified, extended, or even contradicted uh, the previous work. And nowadays, right, or today, research by X, Y, and Z, or someone else, represents the current state of the, uh, the, current state of the field. Right? Um, uh, so in the packet, as, uh, as a matter of fact, we have another example. Um, so feel free to refer to the example if you want, but I think chronological is a really useful, but also um, it, it's, it's not only, I think it's useful and also it's fairly straightforward. And ultimately, um, we're going to look at the very last one, uh, seminar study. Uh, so it begins with detailed description of extremely, of an extremely important study, or sometimes extremely important studies, plural. Um, and oftentimes, later work is organized using another pattern. Right? So this is extremely helpful when you are, um, when you think, when you want to single out a particular study that's groundbreaking, that's fundamental to your field of study. Right? So you think that nobody else's can surpass the importance of that single study. Right? So you want to single out, you want to single out that particular uh, research because he lays the groundwork for future research. Uh, so here are some examples. Um, here are some typical, typical language uh, you, can, you can borrow and use in your literature review essay. The most important research on the topic was studied by X in, uh, in an earlier date. Following this person's study, research fell into two camps. Right? So notice how uh, the first entry of source is fundamental uh, to that particular discipline. Uh, that's why you feel a need, uh, you feel obligated to single out this particular research because it's so important and nobody else's afterwards is capable of uh, replacing or even surpassing its importance. Uh, but obviously, it still allows room for critique and challenges, right? Um, not that, I mean, there's, not that you can't really do anything about the, 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 prime, uh, the preliminary, the, uh, the, the first research. There's still room for improvement and the critiques. Um, there's, another, there's another example uh, on page 10. Um, but before we do the exercise, we actually have an exercise uh, listed on page 10. Uh, so this exercise has two parts. We have two examples. Um, but before we do that, um, I wonder if any one of you has any questions. If we don't have any questions, we're going to take a five-minute bathroom break. But before the bathroom break, any questions about the organizational pattern? Yes. I'm sorry? Chronologically, yeah. Yeah, this is a great question. Uh, I, I would say it really depends on disciplines. Um, so I know for the sciences, uh, especially the hard sciences, I think scientists usually don't really go all the way to the 17th century. 
Um, it's very uncommon, as a matter of fact. Uh, but say, for example, um, Mackenzie, as a matter of fact, who's a Renaissance, Renaissance scholar, uh, she oftentimes cites um, materials that date all the way back to Renaissance period. And she even visited archives. Right? Those archives were produced. Um, no, you don't do archival research? I was completely making things up. Oh, she's not that kind of Renaissance scholar. She's totally, she has, she has a lot of political edges. You know, she's like totally up to date. <laughs> but anyway, so it really depends on the disciplines. Um, I, I think even in the social sciences, as a matter of fact, I think I've heard, um, you know, sociology professors who literally told their students that they can just like go into uh, the past two decades, and that's about it. Um, so I would say um, what we are providing here at the, at the Graduate Revenue Center is very generic, you know, one size fits all kind of information. But if you want to uh, know a little bit more about it, uh, you should definitely talk to your advisor or talk to, you know, talk to your peers, uh, you know, your, your friends in the lab uh, to, get, to get more information from them. One thing, can I, can I one Yes, thing? Okay. Sure. So one thing I would say as somebody who studies things that are really old um, is a good place to pick up your chronology is if there's a turning point that is relevant um, to what you're studying. So like maybe something shifted in the 80s, right? Um, so then you could start there. You could say like scientific research had assumed X until 1980 when someone did Y and shifted. And then you can follow from the 80s to the present, right? Um, so you avoid having to cover like everything that's ever happened. Uh, so that can be a useful, one of, one of the useful strategies. Mm -hmm. All right. OK, so any other questions? Yes. Yes, under the, under the um, seminal study mm -hmm. part, um, I was wondering how could I, as a student doing the research, doing the literature review, mm -hmm. um, constitute what is seminal? What the literature says or what I think is the groundbreaking study? Uh, okay, so the, the seminal study, I feel like uh, a lot of the times people agree upon the seminal study, right? You, you don't really make your, I, I don't, so I mean, correct the, me, correct so me if I'm wrong. So what the literature says is seminal, not what? No, not you think what is seminal. You, you, it's always agreed upon, right? So uh, scholars in your field of study or your professors, we, you, you guys all agree that this is very groundbreaking. This is fundamental. This is definitely, uh, you know, the watershed of uh, your discipline, right? Um, you, you don't really, I think, um, I think, I mean, personally, there, there might be research that's extremely appealing to yourself. I mean, I have, I've had those experiences. You know, some study, I feel like, you know, I had that aha moment, right? This is the type of research that really appeals to me, that drew me in. But still, you know, what people, uh, usually seminar study is very much widely accepted, right? Does that answer your question? Yeah, it yeah. seems to be that whatever the field says. Yeah, whatever the field that's, agrees upon. That's the same, okay. Exactly, yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm glad, uh, that's a great question. I'm glad that I could um, clarify that point. Thank you. Um, so my question is, I guess if you have to choose one of these approaches, or how might you choose one of these approaches for different applications? So if you're writing a literature review for an article, that's very different than writing a literature review for your thesis or your dissertation, or for writing for an applied outreach document. It, is, are there any general rules for which approach you would take and which outlet? Um, yeah, I think I, I, think I didn't really uh, mention this um, when I was taking over from, from McKinsey, but uh, don't feel obligated that you can only choose one out of the five. As a matter of fact, you can always combine uh, two and three of them. Right, so um, I, think, I think the rationale, or really the, the rule of thumb is what suits your need, right? Uh, there are sections, for example, chronological uh, development. Um, I think it, it's very rare for someone's literature review to be entirely following a chronological order, right? 
So you probably, when you are providing some of the background information, you follow the chronological organization. And when you, when you move to more um, about your own research, you start to establish the scholarly conversation and sort of uh, put them into a debate with, with one another. Right? So chances are uh, you mix and match um, with many of the approaches that we, are, we talk about it. As a matter of fact, um, in, the, in the exercise, you might be, uh, we, might, we might see an example of how um, the author can combine two approaches uh, in a single, in, I guess in, in two paragraphs. Mm -hmm. All right, any other questions um, or comments? All right, so why don't we take a five minute bathroom break? Um, and then afterwards we can come back for the, for the exercise. We're going to go ahead and get started on exercise two, part one. Um, so this does come in two parts. You've been given two uh, kind of samples of, it's just like bare bones information. Um, so you pick whether you want to do example one or example two. It would probably take too long for everybody to do both. So get in a group of people and pick example one or example two. And then what you're going to do is essentially form a narrative giving, using the information that you've been given um, and using whatever kind of organizational method you think is most appropriate based on what we've been talking about today. Um, so remember you haven't been giving any framing sentences or any transitions or anything like that. So those are things that you also want to include in your like mini lit review paragraph, right? You want to frame the information, transition from sentence to sentence while you're also applying the organizational method that you see fit. So that is the first part of exercise two. And we're going to take a substantial amount of time to do that because it can take a little while to get your thoughts together. I'm going to say 10 minutes. Uh, if I check back in in 10 minutes and everybody's still working, we can go a little bit longer and then we'll, we'll do part two of this exercise after that. But go ahead and get in groups and kind of write your narrative together and raise your hand if you have any questions and Chen Chen and I will come around and talk to you.
yeah, just to clarify, example one and example two are two different sets of facts, and I don't need you to make a narrative out of both of them or like combine them to make one narrative. Um, just use example one to make a narrative or use example two. So whichever one you prefer. I just realized the, the instructions maybe not have been crystal clear on that, so.
did about that. All right, uh, so it's probably about time, So, but do we need more time to work on the narrative? More? Do we need more time? Okay, so why don't we spend five more minutes? Uh, all right, guys. Uh, so it's probably time for us to talk about the examples. All right. So before we discuss the examples, uh, I just happen to have this question. I think it might also uh, be applicable to the um, uh, many of you here, right? So if you don't really have a handout and you want to get an access to a handout, 
Um, so this question raises the question, can we get a, hand, get, get a copy of the handout? Sure, right? So even if you lose the handout you receive today, um, you, you can easily download them and you can easily find them, access them, and download them from our website, which is uh, if you go to gwc.psu.edu, and we have a tab uh, called Writing Resources, and you, you click on the Writing Resources tab, it's on the bottom right. And you should be able to easily locate uh, the handout for how to write a literature review. And also we have um, many other different kinds of handout and different packets. Um, so if you, uh, in the future, uh, want to look at your CVs and resumes or personal statements, chances are we might have copies of, hand, of those handouts. Uh, and then we frequently update our website. So, um, so let's talk about the examples. Um, so, um, so we have two examples. So for those of you who pick the first one, uh, I wonder what kind of organizational structure uh, you have chosen for your, for your narrative. Anybody? I want you to read to us your narrative. Yes, please. I oh. Generalities. <laughs> yeah, sure. So, so no we, we broke we broke the uh, we broke it down according to the topical arrangement, and the three main topics which we discussed was number one would be advisory requirements. So we discussed the minimums and maximums which existed. Mm -hmm. The second was what it, we referred to as student data. So the minimum, maximum, and then the average time. Mm -hmm. And then the third point we wanted to highlight was we perceived it sort of as the weakness of what we just discussed, and that was that it was, had not considered um, the specific field of study. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So you it. have divided prior scholarship, I guess this person, have ch um, I guess you have divided the prior scholarship right. into three themes, right? Three different subfields, right? Yeah, so that's um, topical organization. Yeah, yeah. Um, anybody else's? Does anybody, um, any disagreements? So we, we are all in agreement that there should be a topical organization. Sure, okay, so how about the second example? Yeah, did anybody choose the second example at all? Nobody? <laughs> oh. okay. Um, okay, so why don't we, uh, so if you, if you just flip to page 10, I think uh, the next page, as a matter of fact, you should be able to find the original arrangement uh, of those um, entries of sources, right? So, um, yeah, you might, you might want to just gloss over uh, the original way of organizing all the sources. Um, you know, check on the organizational pattern they use, um, as well as the framings, the, pr the transitions, how they organize their sources, how they synthesize the materials, how they, how they critique, then compare those materials, and see how, how, it's, how it is similar or different from uh, your arrangement your preferred way of organizing the materials. Mm -hmm. right. So even though that's the original arrangement, but that, that doesn't mean that that's the only way to arrange your materials, right? So it really depends on your argument. It really depends on what you want to make your literature review essay do uh, to your ultimate argument, right? So it really depends on what your stance is, what your argument is, right? You can um, arrange them in, very, in various different ways, right? Um, all right. So, uh, do we have any questions about the original arrangement? Um, all right. So I know everyone is exhausted, um, 
but you only have to deal with me for like another 20 minutes tops, maybe even 15. We'll see what we can do. Um, the last little bit, we're just going to kind of go through briefly, you know, some things you have to think about once you've done your analyzing and planning uh, and all of your research and stuff like that. So when you get to the point where you're finally ready to put your ideas down on paper, um, just some very, very briefly some things you want to think about, right? Um, so these are some things that I like to keep in mind as I'm starting my literature review. Um, exigency being number one, right? Um, you want to kind of show your reader, why the heck am I writing this? Why are you reading this, right? Um, from the very beginning of your liter literature review or your introduction, right, if you're writing a larger paper. Um, so it's going to be very clear to you, and your challenge is obviously going to be making it clear to everybody else. Um, so I encourage you to be really, really explicit about your exigence, because a lot of people kind of jump right into the facts without first establishing why this matters. So uh, you can think of it, um, I think Michelle kind of talked about this similarly in the introductions wor workshop, but think of it as addressing the problem um, that exists out there that your research or the research that you're going to review kind of helps solve, right? So you want your exigency to be very clear. You want to have a really good sense of that when you start writing. Obviously, you want to have a very clear thesis statement, um, and I know that sounds really basic, but um, it's, it's good to remember that, you know, like, you want to write your thesis statement as explicitly and as specifically as you can before you even get, get started with the rest of this stuff, because it's going to help focus your whole argument. And then obviously you want to have your organizational method all panned out. Um, are you going to use one organizational method or two and which ones? And you know, do some thinking about why, right? If I'm using debate, is that because um, I want to make my topic seem like really snappy um, and vibrant and like people are really passionate about it? Um, if I'm using chrono chronology, do I want to show that like for the past 20 years, people have been using variations of method X but I have this whole new method that I want to share with you guys, and that's really exciting, right? Um, so make sure you think about, you know, which method is going to link with your exigence the best, right? Um, so, you know, if you have this problem, think about the problem and then think about what method will illuminate the problem most clearly. Okay, and then obviously you'll want to think a little about intro and conclusion, so we're going to talk about that ever so briefly. Okay, um, so just some basic information about introductions. These are things that, again, you want to explicitly state in your introduction that people often forget to explicitly state. Um, so you kind of want to start out with the scope. Are you kind of doing a literature, this is a literature review of research from the last 10 years from these major articles? Are you doing a, you know, comprehensive literature review of all of the work done on this topic because there isn't very much, right? So tell your audience very explicitly what the scope of your literature review is going to be in your introduction. Provide some background like we mentioned, right? And then demonstrate the importance. So I talked about the exigence, being really explicit about that. Uh, obviously near the end, end of the introduction, you're going to want to make your claim, right, your thesis statement. Um, and then offer a roadmap for the rest of your research. So if those of you who were here for Michelle's workshop, there are a lot of similar components to writing a compelling and newsworthy introduction. Okay. I don't think we need to go over thesis statements very much. There is information in your packet about them, but I think, you know, at the grad student level, most people are pretty clear what a thesis statement should look like, but obviously it's not just a claim, it's an argument, right? So it needs to be really argumentative. Um, and, you know, these are good things that thesis statements can do. Um, so they don't necessarily have to do all of these things, uh, but they should, should do one or two of them. All right. So we're not going to go through the examples. All right. So conclusions. Um, actually, surprisingly, conclusions are something that clients seem to struggle with, at least in my experience. So I just like to go over very quickly what a conclusion looks like or a good conclusion. Um, a lot of people think the conclusion is just where I tell you what I've already told you and then that's it, I'm done, and I get to run, run away, right? Like, ah, I wrote the whole paper. I'm just gonna, just gonna leave it here and never think about it again. Um, but obviously, you know, 
you don't want to just tell them what you've already told them. A conclusion should also add something new. Um, so provide some sort of closure, right? So this is what I've shown you. Yes, we do want that, but we also want to know, like, okay, why is it important that I have shown you this? Um, so what? What does this finding mean? What is the significance of it, right? Um, and a lot of people that, for a lot of people, that manifests in like these are future implications for their work, right? Um, so these findings are important because we can take them and we can do what with them. Or these findings are important because they let us know that we've been approaching research the wrong way for a very long time, right? So providing closure, explaining so what, and then saying, well, where are we going to go from here? Because um, you don't want to leave your audience thinking, oh, well, everything is terrible. Or, OK, you've restated your facts, right? You want to give them a sense that there is some moving forward and there is improvement to be made in the way that your field is being approached. OK. I'm not going to talk too much about citations, but I just like to give a few warnings about citations because literature reviews are obviously very citation heavy. Um, I feel like a lot of people, and this is most frequently very beginning grad students, they feel like, oh my gosh, I don't, like, have, I don't have the expertise, I don't quite know what to say, and so they quote a lot. Um, but actually, you want to be very careful about the amount of times that you quote. Uh, I think a good general rule is you want direct quotes to be less than 10% of anything that you write. Um, so you should be focusing on paraphrasing and summarizing and only quoting when it's absolutely necessary. Um, so not just when it's convenient for you, right? Because um, when you quote for the sake of your own convenience, what that does is it keeps you from synthesizing and it keeps you from leading your audience through, you know, this is what I want you to get out of this evidence, this is what I want you to understand. If you just drop quotes and like run away, then that leads to a literature review that sounds a whole lot more of a, like a whole lot more of a summary than it does like an analysis. So that's just a general warning that I like to give about citations. Don't quote um, too, too much. All right, so this is hopefully what we've learned today, um, crossing my fingers. Um, so as you read, trying to see how things fall together, what's the big picture of your research, and how can I convey that big picture to the people who are reading my literature review, to the people in my field. Um, making sure that you have your scope focused in early so that you don't waste a lot of time reading extra things, taking extra notes, um, you know, summarizing things or even drafting things into your literature review that you're not going to need, um, that you're later going to have to cut, right? So narrowing that scope in early, making sure that you're balancing summary and analysis very carefully, uh, mostly making sure not to be too heavy on summary, but to be analyzing whenever it's possible. Uh, and making sure that you keep in mind, you know, your purpose for writing, right? Um, so being very reader focused instead of writer focused, not what do I want to do, but what do my readers need from me? How is this going to help them? How can I make the points that they need to understand as clear as possible? And then being meticulous about citations, right? So not too much quoting, but also, you know, whenever you submit something, obviously you have to just make sure that you're using the proper format and stuff like that. Okay. So before I let you all go, I just want to say a couple of things, maybe mainly just one thing. Um, so this has been kind of a two-part workshop series where we focused on the introduction, the literature review. In a few weeks, we do have a peer review um, session where we'll have people submit drafts about a week before the peer review session, and we'll put you in groups based on subject, and we'll have you review each other's papers. I think at the moment we're planning to open the peer review with just a little, a few notes on, you know, how you review other people's papers and how you revise your own work when you're thinking about publication. But the majority of the session is going to be devoted to participants kind of reviewing each other's papers um, and asking us questions. We'll obviously be there to answer any questions that anybody has. Um, and I know peer review sounds like, oh, I don't know, I want an expert, right? But actually getting someone who is, you know, fresh eyes, someone who maybe hasn't read your work, 
is an invaluable source and obviously will be there to answer any questions about writing as well. And it's also just a good excuse to like give yourself a deadline that you have to meet, right? So I have to have, you know, a partial draft or full draft of something, whatever article, whatever you're sending off, um, written by this date. And the date will be, I think, July 1st, something close to that. So you guys have a little bit of time to kind of think about what we've gone over in these two workshops and apply it and write something if that's something that you're interested in doing. All right. So if anybody has any final questions, Chen Chen and I will be hanging out until 4 um, today, so for the next 10 minutes or so. Otherwise, please be sure to fill out your surveys and either leave them at your seat or this table or the table behind you. If you haven't signed in, we have a whole blank sheet up there, so please do sign in. Um, and thank you so much for attending and coming to hang out with me and listen to me ramble. Thanks.